go through it, right? But like, this seems like this seems called a cage match where like you like basically like put two people in like a cage and have to fight each other to the death. Well, not to the death, but to like to whatever fake death WWF is going to have. This is awesome, but it's uh, <laughs> interesting to see what happens. All right. So at any point, um, oh, my hair is all messy. All right. Um, we're going to, so, so some things about researching public policy, right? There are a couple websites that are going to be really good tools for you. You're not required to use them, but I would recommend them. Um, and there's some differentiations, um, between them. So the first one is called Brookings. It's the Brookings Institute. It's brookings.edu, I believe. Eh, not wood. And the Brookings, so this is a, a, a policy think tank, right? Oh, there we go. All right. And so Brookings is, is so the thing to remember when you're doing public policy research, right, is that most sites that have public policies, papers, resources, uh, analysis, whatnot, are going to have, surprise, surprise, a political leaning, right? So just, and it's nothing that you can't use. Sometimes the best data for your public policy proposal, so say, I mean, so okay, just hypothetically speaking, right? Say somebody is like, I'm writing a paper on like reducing gun control, so like pro second amendment paper, right? I write to increase people's ability to buy guns, right? Like some of the best data for that paper might come from a site that's left leaning and wants more gun control just because they have a mass the kind of data that you want to talk about in your paper. Does that make sense? So, like for example, Brookings Institute, which I'm on right now on the big screen, right, is a left of center site. So if you're looking for like I mean, we say like liberal, Democrat, however you want to put it right. Like their, their policy prescriptions and their research is due to a more left of center agenda. Okay. As not that that's right or bad, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like be aware of what you're getting into when you're doing research because everybody has a slant on stuff, right? And so when you read something on Brookings, uh, Brookings Institute, it may very well have a more leftist slant on it, which is fine. Just be aware. If you're looking for something that has a leftist slant, then look at Brookings, right? The other side I'm going to show you in a second, the Cato Institute is a right of center website, right? It has more right-leaning policies, right? More conservative-leaning policies, or what's called conservative-leaning policies, right? And so it's not, again, neither good nor bad, but just, like, be aware of, like, what you're looking for and what information you want for your public policy, okay? So remember the other day when I put up on the board, like, the first thing is the inherency, right? Which is, like, well, inherency harms, right? The inherency is why is the status quo not changing? Why is there why is the situation that's causing the problem we're trying to solve intractable? Right? Why is it not being solved already? And the harms are what harms are there in the status quo? What is the status quo producing that is bad, right? So when we're looking at our public policy research, the first place to start is better ask ourselves, like, well, like, what is the status quo? Right? And the status quo remembers this Latin phrase means like the way things are right now, more or less, right? I mean, it's a not literal translation, right? But, like, what's going on right now? What is the current situation? And so the first thing, if you're going to write public policy about something you want to change, you better know what the current public policy is, right? And so places like this or um, or Cato Institute, right, are a good idea to get – or a good place to get an idea about what the current public policy scenario is, right? Because if you're going to change something, you probably know what it is before you try to change it, right? Otherwise, you'll sound silly. All right. So this is Brookings Institute, okay? So they have a cool, if you look at the top tab here, um, you know, if you all have like pens or pencils or paper, like go ahead and like put in Brookings and like um, bookmark it or freaking like write down Brookings.ed or if you have a good memory, whatever. Let's do that then. All right. So they have a, a, a um, what do you call it? A, a, top, a topical um, toolbar here, right? So you can get more, you'll go to, a, so here you go. So by topic, business and industry, cities and regions, defense and security. Education, all topics, sure. Global development, global economy, healthcare policy, international affairs. So this will sort policy papers by the kind of topic, right? So let's say somebody's going to do, oh, uh, what? Let's look at what's interesting. Everything's interesting, but um, marijuana policy, there's a favorite topic, right? So here under marijuana policy, right, you have a series of articles, right? So these are like the most recent articles, okay, that Brookings has by this topic, right? And then you have underneath it reports. And the reports are not so much like opinion pieces or thinking pieces. The reports are like statistical analysis. that will give you more data and more idea about what's going on right now, right? So, for example, we can look at this, right? Banking regulations create a mess for marijuana industry, banks, and law enforcement from April 23rd, 2018. So this is right after we got legalized in Colorado. I don't remember that. It's like a rush on Colorado's border from all the surrounding states. 
All right, and so actually, what's happening? Funny, um, not, it's not ha ha funny, but funny is that so. Because it's about weed, the government's not letting me show on the screen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Maybe not. All right. So what happened was that uh, in Colorado, at least, right, um, even though it was legal in Colorado to sell marijuana, like, over-the-counter to people for recreational use, right, it was still against federal law to sell marijuana. And so any money, any of the distributors or the shops in Colorado were selling marijuana, right, could not put the money from the marijuana sales in a bank because that would be a federal crime still. The federal government was still prosecuting people for taking what would be drug money, right, i.e. the money they made from legally selling marijuana, right, and putting it in a bank. And so you had, like, literally, like, bags of cash, like, sitting around the marijuana dispensaries and it started becoming targets for, like, robbery because you have, like, hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash money sitting there in the freaking um, dispensary, right? So I have a brother who's, like, I'm too much better than I have. Well, I have three brothers and three sisters, Um the next young, I'm the oldest. Haha. <laughs> um, the next youngest one is like six four, like two eighty five, and like pure muscle. And he's now a, he's a almost a Delta Force, uh, an army. He was a Marine before that. He's like he's got a body like a Greek god. I hate him, um, but like I love him though. So, anyways, it was a point in time where he got out of the Marine Corps and hadn't joined the army again yet to do the special forces stuff. And he was like, all right, like I'm gonna. So he was in Colorado and he's like started working as like a security guard slash like money guard for the marijuana dispensary. <laughs> so his job would be like literally like sit in a room with a whole bunch of bags of money with a gun and just like make sure no one took it all day. And at the end of the day, they'd like take it from the freaking dispensary to like a storage unit <laughs> and like put this money in the storage unit. And then it was like a very like high security storage unit, right? But like that was his job. And he made pretty decent money. But like so but they couldn't put any of the money from the marijuana sales in the banks. Because if they put the money from the marijuana sales in the banks, it would be a federal crime. And the dispensary, which is legally selling marijuana, would then be prosecuted under like federal drug trafficking laws, which is like not a pretty picture. So I'm assuming that this is what this article is about, right? Um, but yeah. Yeah, more or less this is what it's about. All right. So if you so if you go to a marijuana policy or a, 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 a policy proposal paper on the legalization of marijuana, right? Um, and you're looking for, and like these, these guidelines haven't really been changed. I think Colorado put some laws in place that made it so like they wouldn't let federal agents come in and call out and prosecute people who were selling marijuana legally through dispensaries, right? But it was still it's still kind of an issue, right? So, so if you're looking at like, what's a harm? So you look at the harm of the marijuana policy, right? Okay, so right now people can like be put in jail for putting money in a bank that like is otherwise a legal transaction, right? Then that could be a harm in the status quo. I, mean, I keep pointing where I once wrote harm in the bar, right? That could be a harm in the status quo, right? People are being maybe unjustly prosecuted or could be unjustly prosecuted or merely putting money in the bank from which otherwise a legal transaction, right? I mean, whether or not you agree with marijuana being legalized, like that's still kind of effed up either way you look at it, right? That like, people are doing something that's legal and because the federal government hasn't changed its law, can be prosecuted for that, right? So if you're interested in, like, finding out what the, the status quo is or finding harms for a marijuana paper, right, this would be a good place to look for this, an article like this. Um, let's find here. All right. I'm trying to find a good example of uh, – so that's Brookings. Um, that's basically outline Brookings stuff. So you have um, other tabs here, right, Policy 2020. So, like, current policy issues for, like, the election that's going on, right, police accountability, Senate filibuster, the Supreme Court nominee, right, uh, another marijuana idea. <laughs> Right, student loan benefits that uh, freaking mail by voting fraud. Right, all these different things are hot button topics. Right, so then you can go to um, go back and get the tab again. Right, international affairs, so it's like foreign policy stuff. Right, and you can look at other like within this. Right, democracy, global and government policies, human rights, illicit trade, Islamic movements or Islamist movements. Right, so illicit trade, I think, probably like um, so illegal fishing. Poppy licensing in Mexico. Poppy licensing is like so poppies is like where opium comes from. I don't know if you know that. Like so that's why in uh y'all seen Wizard of Oz. Ever like it's like poppies, poppies, that'll make them sleep. Ha ha ha. And they're like walking through a poppy field and they all fall asleep. But that's not you don't get high on opium from walking through a poppy field. <laughs> but like in Hollywood, that's how they do it. Right. In reality, what happens is you gotta like because I was in Afghanistan, we have like, all the poppies, right? The whole world, right? So like part of the year, right? Like poppy ripens up and has a seed pod. You go along, you see the seed pod with a knife on the sap comes out. And that sap is like where all the opium is. 
It's been a couple of Marines my platoon got in trouble because it was like going out at night and like stealing the open puppies and like hitting it in their freaking barracks room. They got they got hella prosecuted. But yeah, it's actually kind of pretty. Looks like the slap like the slap like comes out right. It's like this really like shiny right and like hard. You know, y'all know what amber is. Y'all seen Jurassic Park? Right, I got that little mosquito trapped in the amber, right? It looks like that. Like, it comes out and gets all hard, and, like, this, it looks like a jewel, like a gem kind of, right? But it's open. It'll get you high, apparently. I mean, not apparently, it will. But don't do it. Right. All right. So other reports, right, about international security, um, things like this. Fentanyl and geopolitics, right? Controlling opioid supply for China. I know a couple people are interested in, like, opioid epidemic topics, right? Like, these would be good papers to read for that, maybe. And a lot of these are just not so, – so these reports papers, rather, I was talking about, are not, like – you should do that, like the U.S. should do this, or like policy description, right? The reports are more just like, here's the state of this issue right now, right? So if you go up top to like these policy recommendation papers, like Policy 2020, right? That's going to give you like an analysis of the situation and what the person from the think tank like thinks should be done about it, right? So it's a lot of facts in there, but a lot of opinions in there too, right? These reports or at least try to be more just the facts, right? Or they just that's what they claim to be, yeah? So let's so there's Brookings. Um, let's go ahead and look at Cato now. So C A T O. Okay, thanks, dude. Okay, not Cato Fashions. Yeah, let's do. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So very much the same kind of like layout, right? You have policy topics here on. On the left here, right, and on the top you have like our experts, our centers, right. So I don't know. We're gonna look at foreign policy, and national security again, right? Let's look at that. That looks scary. Um, nuclear weapons. What we should know today, right? You go down. There's more. So this is about nuclear weapons, right? Anti-nuclear, anti-nuclear, the the the. Nuclear anti-proliferation policy in the Canadian conundrum, same policy proposals. Building a modern military, the force that meets geopolitical rally. So, you know, you know what proliferation means? Who wants to win the gold stock of the dance? Oh, proliferation. No, that's okay. Anybody? Did you Google it? Damn it. That's cheap. Academic dishonest. No. <laughs> proliferation means to increase, to spread, right? So there are two kinds of proliferation. Let's see if you can guess what they mean now. Did I already Google vertical and horizontal too? Okay, good. All right. So there's vertical proliferation and there's horizontal proliferation. Any guesses what horizontal proliferation is? Like horizontal horizon, like don't touch that computer, Caleb. <laughs> horizontal proliferation is like wide, right? Like the horizon. Horizontal line, right? It needs to spread out. So nuclear proliferation horizontally is like a whole bunch of different people getting nuclear weapons, right? And I guess what vertical proliferation is? Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> vertical proliferation is like a single country or a couple of countries having a whole F ton of nuclear weapons, right? So during like the Cold War, right, the U.S. and Russia vertically proliferated, right? They had all, we all had like, like one nuclear weapon for every like, you know, man, woman, and child in the country. It wasn't that much, but we had a lot, right? Horizontal proliferation is like we're worried about like nuclear bombs, like people from going to Ukraine, like stealing their old nuclear weapons and like running away to like Tehran or whatever they're trying to blow the whole world up. That's like horizontal proliferation, okay? So horizontal proliferation is the spread. Other people, vertical proliferation is like building up a lot of nuclear weapons like within a country, right? Does that make sense? All right. Well, uh, I probably like something to that, right? All right. So the idea is like, what's the, difference, what's the danger of the proliferation? The problem with proliferation, generally speaking, right, is that you have countries that don't have like best security in the world, like North Korea. Like, y'all seen the, the geo um, satellite images, these geostatic satellite images of like Korea at nighttime? Like, South Korea has like lights on and stuff, right? And it's like it looks like like New York City or like well not you know there's lights on, right? North Korea is like a dark spot because <laughs> they don't have a stable government or stable power or much of anything, right? Like I'm sure like Kim Jong Un's or Kim Jong Il's little mansion is like all lit up nice and whatever, right? Because we got people like they're like running like hamsters on wheels, powering it probably. Oh, yeah. 
like the point being is that like you have a country that can't like keep the power on, right? It's very hard to consider about how secure the nuclear weapons facilities may or may not be, right? Like if you can't keep the spotlights on and motion sensor lights on, so someone can't come and steal your nuclear warhead, you got to worry about somebody coming and taking the nuclear warhead and getting away, right? So that's what this article I'm assuming is about, right? The idea that there is a threat because nuclear uh, North Korea has nuclear weapons, right? Well, if somebody who's like a little more sinister than North Korea, I believe, but there probably are people out there, right? Um, come in and take some nuclear weapons and like go away with them and then use them, right? Um, that's that's the, the threat of nuclear proliferation. Um, and there's some po- obviously there are some policy proposals for that here, right? So basically the same kind of way in Abbey. There's also a search bar up here, so you can search for whatever you want. Somebody want to shout out one the topic there? Then we got to do a quick search here, and as if I was researching for you. I mean, if somebody's like doesn't want to talk about the topic. Uh, all right, so if we we're doing a topic on sex trafficking, right? Here is you put that in the search box up top right here is a number of articles on sex trafficking, sex and security in Afghanistan, right? So there's a whole bunch of different articles related in some way, right, to sex trafficking laws, sex trafficking policy. So if you're like, hmm, like I want to see what's up with that policy, right? I want to try a place to start my, um, you know. My, my research is a good place to start. Here's another, like, um, so this is in 2019. Here's a, this is about, apparently, a sex tracking, a sex trafficking um, court case, right? And you can download the whole legal briefs or whatever, right? And talks about, like, the first, like, the deal with, um, there's, like, surveillance on individuals who may be in sex trafficking, like, operations, right, enforcement, First Amendment rights, right? Like, you're posting something online, right? Like, what protections do you have, right? And so it's, like, I mean, if you want to look about maybe a problem for, a problem that exists with laws that could be closed up that would protect people from sex trafficking is like the ability to post like things online or have cell phone ads or whatever, right? And so it's talking about like blackpage.com, which was like a most poor like site where people would go to like find sex trafficking information is like the black web idea, right? And so like the idea that this could be closed down then, right, was as part was a subject of a Supreme Court case. And so this would be a good place to look to start looking at policies that relate to and laws and rulings that relate to sex trafficking in America, right? Does that make sense? Like how this might be helpful? All right, cool. Um, let me find... So what I want to do now is not... So those two, those two um, websites to look at, they'll be helpful for researching for policy. I would recommend starting there. Also, you can do a Google, a Google Scholar search. Those work okay. Um, let me see. Um, oops, let's check that out. What I'm trying to show you, show you now is there's a kind of a life hack on research that we can use for any class. Um, let's look for cool. I don't know if this. I don't even know what this paper's about, right? But that's another point. So for any kind of, I mean, it's about COVID. But the point is that at the end of every paper, like what what comes at what what comes at the end of every paper that's like scholarly, academic, like research. If I make you write a research paper in class, your high school teacher makes you write a research paper, your biology teacher makes you write a research paper, what's the last thing that happens in the paper? After you conclude, like, so uh, paper's over, what comes next? You're excited about that one, right? So guess what? If you want to find, like, that's what I'm getting. People get all freaked out, like, oh, you have to have eight sources in this paper, like, four sources in the paper, five sources. Like, I can't find five sources. Like, bullshit, you can't. Like, Go to any paper you like. If you find a, just find a paper. Just find a paper online, right, that you agree with or that backs your point up, right? And then go to the bibliography. And guess what? Like, they cite all their sources that say the same thing that they say. And all you got to do is type, take this little thing, right? Oh, goodness. I'm sorry. Oh. So go take this little source right here, the citation, pop that into freaking Google. Boom, you got another paper right there that says more or less the same thing. Take the next one, pop it in there too. You have another source that says the same thing. So really, to do any kind of in-depth academic read, I mean, you've got to read more papers then, right? That's not that hard. So like, at the point in time we have, like right now, just, just by reading even 
just one paper, right? You have 10 sources right, that you can potentially sign in support of your argument. Guess what? Each one of those 10 sources has to be admitted. And then I'll take bibliography or a pork side page. You can go to that and find another paper that says even more what you like, right? Or even more in depth information. Find this bibliography, copy and paste that into Google, find that article. Boom. Like you have within five minutes, you have 35, 45, you have an unlimited number of sources because everything that's going to be academically valuable, right, is going to have a work cited page on it. So, the downside is you've got to then like read all these papers, right? But that's okay. <clears throat> so, essentially, like that's kind of so here, like you mean this one has a hyperlink, you just click that, boom. Look, here's a coronavirus disease report from 2019 with a little map. And guess what's at the end of it? Well, maybe not. They should have some sources. Some of their sources. That's terrible. That's an unsourced CDC article. Well, somewhere they got sources. I'll find them some other day. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Huh. Well, that's odd. I don't know if I trust this thing. I mean, I trust it because it's like a CDC, CDC thing, right? But like somewhere they have a link to their sources, all that. I'm not going to waste your time looking for it right now. But more or less, you have sort of bad on my face. Um, if you have like a freaking article that's going to have sources to it, right? And you'll find those sources. You can click on them, copy, paste them, search them, right? And you can find out what that um, source says and then cite it in your own paper. Another thing, too, right, that's helpful. So you read through a paper, right? You have them quoted. So you have a quote, like, like as Dr. Fauci says in his paper on COVID on April 16th, 2002, like, it's just the same as the flu, end quote, right? Um, that if you want to use that quote in your paper, right, you can get another source in your paper kind of bonus-wise, right? So what you do is you find so you, you find the quote where Dr. Fauci said that, right? Side, so somebody else cites Fauci in that other paper, right? It says, Dr. Fauci said on April 16th, blah, blah, blah. It's just like the flu, Right? Like, oh, I want to use that in my paper because I want to say that thousand cents just like the flu, right? Okay. Well, what you can do then is like take that quote and then find the source for that, right? And then go back to that other source and find where it said it in that, right? You can use like a command find, type the quote and copy paste it, right? And you can quote Fauci from that first, that second source, right? And then you have two quotes and two sources. You have the paper you're signing from, right? And you can cite Fauci's original comment from the original source in your paper too, right? Now you got two sources and two quotations. I mean, provided you put something from the first paper anyway, but before you started that, right? You have two sources and two quotations, and all you have to do is hit like copy paste and command find, and you got it. All right. Does that make sense? Like, it's pretty kind of simple, right? <laughs> Ultimately. And so I guess the thing is, like, if you're people who are like, not people, like, your students who are like, I, I don't know what to like to research, how to find things that agree with what I'm saying. Just find one thing. Like you gotta, you gotta work hard, kind of find that first thing, right? That for that first paper, that first piece of research that agrees with what you think and agrees with what you're saying. Once you find that and it has the bibliography on it, unlike that freaking CDC site, right? At that point in time, it should be pretty easy to generate research and generate other um, sources for your paper. Okay. So, I mean, I guess that's my uh, research life hack lecture for today. Um, so we're gonna go now turn to what's gonna be a large part of class. I'm not sure if it's going to be this coming Thursday, I mean, like, in two days, or it'll be next Tuesday, but we have to, we, for requirements from the college, we have to do, like, a library day, where we, like, apparently, like, walk 50 feet, and librarians, like, don't plagiarize, okay, like, MLA format, okay, and, like, I mean, I could do that myself, to be honest, but, like, but apparently, my department chair told me we're required to take you, and let them do that with you. <laughs> so, one of these days comes soon, either on a Thursday, or next Tuesday, we'll be just walking like 50 feet and doing that. So just be ready to move. Um, but so the, for the rest of today, then we're just going to kind of um, have a chance to do more research and get more topics solidified. So if you have a topic already, turn it in, great. Um, remember those research, those evidence sheets I sent out or I, I gave out before? Um, we're going to start doing, uh, hopefully, one of those a week from now from now to the end of the semester, okay? We'll have some in class kind of doing every day, like kind of like the last, like, 
20 minutes of class, maybe 30 minutes of class. We'll kind of let that happen. You all can do some research on your own device to do whatever right. I get your papers going. And then I'll be able to answer questions or help with like research. You might have any problems with that. So it's kind of like I'll do a, basically from here on the rest of the semester, I'll do a mini lecture to, or not a lecture at the beginning of the, of the class on right now, just like research today, obviously, right? And then you all do some work and let me help out if you need anything. And after that, we're going to start moving to talk about that book, Rules for Radicals, um, which is the, there's a PDF online I'll send out to everybody. So you all have to buy it again, right? And so we'll start reading bits and pieces of that in class for the first like half of class. And then the second or two thirds of class and the last third of class will be research in class that I can help out if it has hits any, hits any hitches or has any problems. Any, any concerns or comments? No? All right. So I know some people don't have topics completely cemented. Some people have ideas. Some people are, you know, working. So either if you don't have a topic yet, go ahead and start thinking about that more. You can look at the websites I gave you, do some research on it, see what you want to write about. If you have a topic and need help with or ideas about it, I'll open my office up again. You know, come out of my office and we can talk about that. Um, I mean, the people over here visit my office. Um, and if you already have your topic in, uh, let's give it a thumbs up. Then start looking for your first source for your first evidence sheet that'll be due um, on Friday. Cool. I just think like the key to the, the castle with like evidence sheets, like you could like find an article you like and just like copy and paste that from the bibliography and get them all done. I wouldn't recommend doing that. I want you to actually like read them more thoroughly and actually have a good idea what you're quoting and citing before you do this like five evidence sheets at once, right? So that's a way to like write yourself into a hole real quick because all of a sudden you have like five sources and no idea what any of them say. And you're like, okay, now how to turn these to a paper, right? So let me also I'll share the evidence sheet form with everybody on the course site so you can like um, – and it's fine. I'll, I'll make a submission box form too so you can turn them digitally. You don't have – I think actually probably the best plan <clears throat> is to turn them in to the Canvas site because you're going to need accumulate five or six of them throughout the semester. And I find that if there's paper copies floating around, oftentimes students will be like, hey, like – you know that first evidence sheet I turned in and you gave back to me three weeks ago? Like, I lost it. I don't have my source anymore. I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, I give it back to you, so I don't have it. And they're like, oh, I got to redo that. So I recommend if you – I'll put a, a copy you can fill in the PDF format right online. I recommend doing that um, and then submitting it to the, submit to the Canvas site. That way, um, if you lose it or if you forget it or whatever, right, either you through the submission folder or me by accessing it and sending it back to you, We'll always be able to access all the research you turn in. And so there's no questions if, like, even if your computer breaks, right? It's on this, like, um, Canvas Hub thing. So you're, like, more or less safe then, right? Cool. Um, any questions? No? Okay, we'll turn to that then in the live stream. So I don't think they need to. Whoever's watching online probably 